You know, there are a few more things in life that are, that are as exciting as a birth of a baby, right? A baby being born. I mean, just ask the, the Shamless family and the Duff family. It just recently happened. They have new grandbabies, and they're just thrilled about that. And if you've experienced the miracle of birth, you know what a joy that is. Also, how exhausting that is to have a new baby, to be the mother, to, to give birth to the baby, you know? And everybody, you know pays you tribute and is all happy and has these showers for you, uh, but then the postpartum sets in, and, and there are other things that set in, the unwanted baby weight. I'm not talking about the weight on the baby either. Those sort of things, and it's a lot to deal with. You know, so when we come to this time of the year, we, we think about Mary, and we, we you know, we, we magnify her. We, we do. We, we put her on a pedestal because this is a young girl, a, a young preteen girl that is given the huge responsibility of being the mother of the Savior of the world. Now, I know we pay a lot of attention to the baby. It's a big deal about Jesus being a baby. But I want us just for a moment to pay more attention to what that baby represents and who that baby represents. He represents our Savior. He is our Savior. Isaiah says, and a child shall lead them. A baby leads us. An infant leads us that would grow into a man, a man that will experience everything that you and I have experienced. And worse than that, folks, every trial and tribulation and pain and grief and sorrow and the weight of the world's sin, he would take on himself. And that's what God chose to do. What an amazing thing for God to do. You might say, man, that's a strange way to save the world, God. You know, why didn't you just come and wipe out our enemies and our oppressors and just be, you know, this mighty warrior, this ruler? But yet he came to live within weak, fragile, human limitations. God came in the unexpected. And isn't that where we find the most hope, joy, and love and peace of the Christmas season? In the most unexpected places, circumstances, and even people. But how many times are you and I looking for the grandiose and, and all the pageantry? I was watching this service the other night, and I am not knocking this by any means, but I was watching a, a church service, and they were already celebrating Christmas, and I've never seen so much lighting and sound. They even had fog machines going. It was the most dramatic thing I think I'd ever witnessed, and I was so caught up in that. It was amazing that I missed the real humble picture of what Christmas is. I believe we have to be careful with that, folks, because we may be looking for that extravagant gift, that extravagant meal. And we all know that many of you already have the Christmas blues. You have the Christmas blues because this reminds you of a time of loss, someone that you don't have with you this Christmas. It may be a pet, that this is your first Christmas without that pet. You know what that's like, Debbie? You do, don't you? I know what that's like. It may be that you're already so stressed from the parties and the baking and the preparation and hosting people in your home that you're ready for it to be over. You know, I'm sure these... Uh, Three moms tonight that are hosting the Progressive Christmas dinners, they're probably stressed. They're like, I have all these kids in my house. They're probably going to have dirty feet. Got to have the house clean. I don't know what, re what they really like. They just like to eat, I'll tell you that. <laughs> You've got plenty of food. They just like to eat. That's one thing I've noticed about this generation. They don't seem to be as picky as some generations. They'll eat whatever you have. We try to keep our cupboard stocked because SJ brings the youth group and everybody else to our house. It's hard. I mean, the stuff, you know what I'm talking about, that you hide in the cupboard and hide in the refrigerator in the corner where you think about it, they find it. <laughs> Somebody even took my raw almonds the other night. I mean, who does that? I mean, I like the almonds. They were gone. It's like, thanks. Eat the Cheez-Its. I don't eat those. Clemson is playing in the Cheez-It Bowl, by the way. Isn't that special? <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there because we're here. So... Christmas is an exciting time, but it can also be a time where you just feel exhausted and weary and warm. So I'm here to lift you up today. It's not going to be really me. It's going to be what God's going to do. He's already lifted you up through our time of worship together. 
And that's going to continue, so I want you to hang on today. One of the reasons that we do give you an insert that's in your seat, and we have it online as well, is we want you to be able to apply what you learn. Probably for the last decade or more, your idea of coming to church is you sit, you hear some music, you sit, you stand, you sit, you stand, you sit, you stand, you pray, you sit, you stand, and you hear a message, and you leave, and you go to eat, and you're like, that was good. But with somebody to ask you about that message or the beautiful music, you would be like, I think they read something from Mary today. Something from Mary. Okay, where was that at? Um, maybe even one of the Gospels. Okay, what else? Um, I felt really good being there. I felt lifted up. Okay, what else? You see what I'm getting at? How many of you have done that for decades? A lot of you have. We want you to be able to apply God's Word in your life in real time. So when you leave here today, what you learn, what you experience, you will carry that out of these doors into that world out there. Because that world out there, and I'm looking at it right now, it's deceiving. It's hurting. It's very dark. Even though it seems light to you, there's a lot of darkness and there's a lot of evil. And who came to overcome the darkness? Jesus did. So we need to get excited about that. You may even find yourself at some point at Misty Creek, you may begin to transform from being a pocket praiser to a halfway hand raiser to all of a sudden you've got them fully up and your wife's looking at you like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? It's okay. There's no judgment here, folks. We want you to let loose in worship and let the Spirit move within your heart. So really for Christmas, though, we think about children and how exciting a time it is for them. It can't get here quick enough for them. But for those of us who are older, it gets here way too fast. You realize that this coming weekend, this next weekend, is Christmas. Are you ready? Be honest. Amazon's good, but you're sweating it, aren't you? You're sweating it. So kids have a different perspective on Christmas than adults do. I mean, for example, there's a woman whose Twitter handle is Mommy Owl. Anybody do Twitter in here? Okay, Mommy Owl posted the following conversation she had with her seven-year-old child. The child said, I wish I could see Santa's naughty list. The mom replied, to see if you're on it. The seven-year-old responded, to see who I could have the most fun with. Think about that for a moment. I think we all feel some sympathy for that mom, don't we? So more proof of this theory that kids' priorities at Christmas are different from parents' priorities can be seen in kids' letters to Santa. And I always have to do a few of these every year. These are new ones. So here are a few examples of letters from kids to Santa from the Internet. Dear Santa Claus, when you come to my house, there will be cookies for you. But if you're real hungry, you can use our phone and order a pizza to go. How about that? Dear Santa, I want a puppy. Let me get some light. Oh, let there be light. Dear Santa, I want a puppy. I want a playhouse. Thank you. I've been good most of the time. Sometimes I'm wild. <laughs> this one's from a four-year-old. Just four now. Dear Santa, I'll take anything because I haven't been that good. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? You know you haven't been that good. You just take anything, right? So I've got some good news for you this morning. It doesn't matter if you haven't been that good this year. It really doesn't matter. Because guess what? Jesus still came for you regardless if you've been good or bad. He came for you. So the Christmas story is a magnificent one, so full of tenderness and love. The young bride-to-be of Joseph knew that God was at work in her life. Her cousin Elizabeth knew too. When she greeted Mary, she spoke with a loud voice, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And Mary answered Elizabeth with a song of joy. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. You know, we would be good to spend a few moments this morning with this charming young woman named Mary, wise beyond her years. 
her experience of Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection was the most intimate of all because she was there to witness it all. A mama. Mamas, think about that for a moment. I I have an inkling that mamas in here really do identify with Mary. And they have a high respect for her, for what she witnessed happen to her son, fleeing for their lives very early on, then getting to experience the time, those three years when he's performing these miracles and, and preaching and teaching the Word of God, and she's getting to see some of that. You know, the show that really perpetrates that well is The Chosen. Have you seen The Chosen? Whether you've seen it or not, our women are going to be doing that study in several different groups. Our men are going to be doing that study. It's an eight-week study, and I invite you to join on. Even if you've seen it yourself and watched it in your own home, I've seen season one over, yeah, right at three times and a few of the episodes more than that. And each time I watch the episode, something new comes to light. I'm like, whoa, I missed that the first and second time. It's one of the most well done films, short series on the life of Jesus, but not just Jesus, the backstories of those involved in his life. And I want you to get beyond whether everything's exactly scriptural or not. And I want you to listen and learn from the characters that Jesus encountered on his his journey from birth to the grave and then his resurrection. It's a powerful thing. It really is. So if Mary were here this morning, what are some lessons that she might share with us as the mother of God's Messiah? I think it's funny this morning. I think the first lesson Mary would share with us is that God is working in the small things of the universe. The very minuscule. Thank you, Doug. You see there? Wait a minute. I want in your job description, but thank you. (laughs) Appreciate that. (laughs) I had to work on a toilet two Sundays ago. You just do what you have to do sometimes, right? So if you're down there and it's not working, you can plunge it because we haven't hired anybody to do that. <laughs> it's okay. If you're walking outside and somebody dropped a napkin, you don't have to look and say, oh, they got a custodial person. We don't. <laughs> just, just pick it up and go put it in the trash. It will not hurt you to do that. Well, maybe it might hurt your back, but just do what you can do. Squat and get it. Okay? So what are some lessons that we can learn from her this morning? Well, first of all, God is working in the small things. He is. That's the message of Christmas, isn't it? That God Almighty, the creator, the lawgiver, the sustainer of all of humankind, the God of the universe, the great I am, set aside his own majesty, his authority, to be born as a tiny baby to a poor young couple. He could have come as a conquering warrior, a charismatic king, a commanding emperor. Instead, God came as a poor, helpless baby to show us that God loves us enough to enter into our daily lives. Every day, he enters into our lives. The Christmas song, Be Born in Me, sung by Francisca Battistelli, expresses this idea beautifully in its second verse. All this time... We've waited for the promise. All this time, you've waited for my arms. Did you wrap yourself inside the unexpected? So we might know that love would go that far. What an incredible gift. In the birth of Jesus, God wrapped himself inside the unexpected. Now, folks, that song, Be Born in Me, will be sung by Sarah Ann DeFries at our night of Christmas worship. You don't want to miss that. You're going to want to be there for that. So go ahead, whatever you had planned, dinner or whatever, make sure you are with us at 7 o'clock. Go to dinner beforehand or afterwards because it will be a transformational service on December 23rd at 7 o'clock, First Baptist Church of Sandy Springs. You know, it's easy to miss the joy of Christmas because we're looking, like I said, for that, that big moment. But the actual Christmas story is almost entirely composed of little private moments of joy when God shared the message of the coming Messiah with humble, poor nobodies, like shepherds, 
or Anna, the widow, praying in the temple, or you and me. Let's think about it for a moment. The other evening, I had opportunity to have um, brunch around the table with my family, uh, my, my parents and my daughter and my son, and, and um, Melody's got a little guy friend now, and uh, Melody's best friend and roommate. And we're gathering around the table, and SJ's there, and the joy, the conversation, I hear them talking. I'm just standing there fixing my plate of homemade biscuits and gravy, by the way, that they made, I didn't make. Melody and Tessa made for us. I would go through the whole menu, but then you wouldn't think of anything else I'm going to say in this sermon. But it was, it was quite amazing. And I'm, just, I'm watching, and I'm about to cry, and I'm emotional lately. As they were just sharing stories around the table. Do people do that anymore? They hardly ever do that. It's fast food. It's get it to go. It's get your little TV tray and go into the TV and turn on Netflix. There's no communication. There's no sharing about your day. There's no telling the stories. I'm just saying, if we're not careful, we're going to miss out on the intimacy that God wants us to have as a community of faith, as a family of faith, and as a family in our own home. That's why we gather. The scriptures say in Hebrews, don't give up on meeting together and gathering together. And guess what? At Misty Creek, we never did. And Amy said it beautifully this morning, didn't she? She wanted to go somewhere where she could worship in person. And thanks be to God, she called Pamela Menifee. I mean, how many of us have called Pamela Menifee? <laughs> Several of us have. Tell me about that church. Is it Mystic? <laughs> Mystic Creek? What is it called? Misty Creek. Oh, okay. We get all kinds of things, folks, don't we? We do. But the simplicity around that table, that's Christmas, isn't it? Simplicity. Henry Nouwen a Dutch priest and writer tells of a small wooden nativity scene that he saw placed underneath a church altar. It was small. It could fit in the palm of your hands. So you've got the figures of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus that were hand-carved. But just below the altar was a large light. When it was turned on, the figurines cast a huge shadow on the wall behind them. In this, he saw the message of the Christmas story. In his words, God's light shining on this small humble family, cast large, hopeful shadows against the walls of our life and our world. That's when we see God most clearly, when his light and hope shine through humble people and simple acts of love. Ray Moeller Jr. was just four years old when he woke up with pain in his hip so severe that his parents had to take him to the hospital. The doctors diagnosed him with a rare painful but treatable hip disorder. Can you imagine four years old with a hip disorder? After about eight hours in the hospital, they discharged him. It was a scary experience for a little boy. After he returned home, Ray couldn't stop thinking about the kids he had met who had to stay in the hospital for days or weeks or even months. And he determined that he could do something to make the experience a little less frightening for them. That Christmas, Ray donated half of his Christmas toys, and half of his birthday presents to the children at the local hospital. Two years later, when Ray was just six, he and his family founded the Little St. Nick Foundation. Since his founding in 2004, the Little St. Nick Foundation has collected and donated over 500,000 toys and electronics to hospitalized kids across the nation. They also create kid-friendly gift bags for emergency departments, family care packages for families of hospitalized children, and anxiety relief programs for kids. This came from a four-year-old, folks. And the foundation actually works to recruit and train kids and teens to work in their collection and donation programs. Truly, a child will lead them. But don't we need to train them? Don't we need to train the children? Don't we need to train them about humility and that God does show up in unexpected places? Simple things, not always pageantry and grandiose. We need to teach them that. They need to see that. They need to learn that when you give to someone in need, that's the greatest gift. That giving rather than receiving is what the kingdom is all about. We need to teach them that, don't we? It's important that we do that. God came as a poor baby to bring us life at Christmas. God used six-year-old Ray Moeller 
to spread joy and hope at Christmas. And God can use you and me to share his joy and hope and love to others. The message of Christmas is that God is working even the small things of the universe. He's working in even the small things of the universe. And the second lesson, and this is in your notes, that we would learn from Mary is that God is working in difficult circumstances. He is. If you will just read through the Bible, you will see that God never chooses the easiest path to accomplish his will. He doesn't do that. He never chooses the easy way. Jesus was born to a young couple who hadn't even consummated their marriage yet. Don't you think Mary and Joseph's family and friends and neighbors wondered and worried and gossiped about Mary's premature pregnancy? And Jesus was born during the reign of King Herod, a ruthlessly ambitious ruler who was willing to kill all the infant boys in the region to prevent any competition for his throne. So what's God's logic in sending the Christ child, the Messiah, to these people and this place at this time? Why doesn't God just choose an easier path for accomplishing his will? You want to know why, don't you? Because according to God's word, God's light shines brightest in darkness. God's power is greatest in our weakness. And God's grace shows up when we least expect it. And the third lesson that we learn from Mary is that God is working in everyone who opens their hearts to him. Isn't it amazing that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, never forces anyone to accept him? He sent an angel to speak to Mary and Joseph ahead of time. He came in the most unlikely manner to the most unlikely people at the most unlikely time so that the world would not be overwhelmed by his power, but overjoyed by his love. God works in the small things of the universe. God works in the difficult circumstances in life. God works in everyone who opens their heart to him. That truth is what motivated Mary's song of joy. She knew. She knew that that bundle of joy was from God. And she had the amazing responsibility of being the earthly mother of the Messiah. Will you let that sink in for a moment? Hmm. Little insignificant Mary. Not known, not popular. And she's the one that God chose to save the world through. Hmm. Hmm. You don't feel so insignificant now, do you? Doesn't God do that? Doesn't he use just ordinary, just average people? He's not into that pageantry. and He's not into how much money you have and what you've amassed. He's looking at your heart and your humility and your willingness to sacrifice yourself for others. That's what he's looking at. And he's watching, especially on Christmas morning, will you pay homage to him first or will you run down to the tree to see what you got and see if it's from Jared's? <laughs> or is the gift from God, is that the gift you'll celebrate the most all through the day? But not just on that one day, every single day of your life. You remember Elmo used to say it, Christmas is every day. <laughs> it is. Christmas is every day. We celebrate the birth of Christ and the newness that he brings. You know, God working in our hearts to transform us is what motivated Mary to write and sing this beautiful song to her cousin. It's still spreading joy all over the world more than 2,000 years later. Those words captivate us, don't they? From Mary, the Magnificat. She opened her heart. She opened her womb to what God had in store for her. What about you? Have you opened your heart to the working of God? Are you ready to welcome Jesus, the Messiah, this Christmas? If you're ready, 
willing and able to do that, you will discover overwhelming joy in your own life. And you'll be able to share that joy with others. Because you want to know something? It's good news, great joy for all. But you know, I'm sure that in between Sunday and this Sunday, even when you make commitments and you say, yes, I want Jesus to be born anew in my heart, I want to live for him, Monday comes, Tuesday gets here, and you get caught back in the chaos again. And Sunday, you finally get to come out of the chaos of the noise and be still for a moment in his presence and learn a little bit more. He wants you to take his yoke upon you every day and learn from him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he's saying to you this morning, come, come unto me, all of you who are weary and tired and weak and worn. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I will give you my strength, supernatural strength. I will give you rest for your weary soul. You won't find rest in maxing out your visa. You won't find rest in baking three pecan or pecan pies, however you put it. You won't find rest in entertaining 30 and 40 people in your home. You only find rest when you surrender your entire being to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You said you've done it, but have you really done it? Do you really want to do it today? Do you really want to make that lifelong, eternal commitment to following the Savior? I'm not talking about the baby. I'm talking about the Savior, the Savior of the world. Let's do it together. Well, Stephen, have you already done that? Yes. But guess what Stephen does? And this isn't one of those preachers the other day he was preaching. He was saying, come on, I'm preaching here. Come on, people. I'm like, it's all glory to God. It has nothing to do with you, buddy. And I send him a private email. I have to call people out sometimes because it's not about us. It's not about me. It's about him. So every day I surrender to the power and authority and lordship of Jesus Christ because without him I'm weak and I'm frail. I can't do it. So I invite you to join with me today. And if you need to do it from where you're sitting, you're like, I'm not used to this kind of thing, Stephen. This is impromptu. We, we're used to up and down, up and down, not on the ground. So you're going to get used to on the ground or in your chair. I'm going to invite you to use your chair today. Now, if you've got a physical ailment, don't do this. We don't want to take you to the ER. But this chair can be your, your altar today. It can be that way. It can be this way. I mean, how many times do you pray like this? And there's nothing wrong with it. You can't get me on the camera. How about pray to receive? Because that's what prayer is. You can bow your heads, but pray to receive. If I'm going to receive Jesus, I'm not going to be doing this. I'm going to be be receiving him. You can do that. You can even come down to this altar. And this is not a comfortable floor, but you know what? You might just stand here, might get on one knee, and just open your hands. I'm going to invite you to do that. This is not a show. You don't have to do it. You can just sit there and be still. But I will tell you this. As folks are making that commitment, even if you sit there and be still, God will speak to you. His word will not fall void. His prayers will be heard. We're your intercessors. If you're online with us this morning, no matter where you are, pull over on the side of the road right now if you're listening. I don't want you to bow your heads. And I want you to lift your hands up. You can lift your heads if you want to. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want us to pray it out loud. We're going to claim it today. You know, we are favored. And God has his hand on us. And we're going to celebrate that. Almighty God. Thank you. For having your hand on me today. And today. Because of your faithfulness. Your persistence, your perseverance. I'm opening my heart anew to receive Christ into my heart. For the Messiah to be born anew in me. I claim it and I name it. 
I love you, Lord Jesus. I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Forgive me of my sin and set me free. Baptize me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And now I'm going to pray just to me for you. Lord, as we hold out our hands this morning, we pray that your power would manifest itself in us from the very top of our heads to the very tips of our feet. May we know you. We may not fully understand right now, but we ask that you reveal in your time your mysteries, your wisdom, your, your knowledge, and your purpose. Help us to get plugged in to this church or a Bible-believing, truth-seeking church, Lord. Help us to surrender every day to you and no longer, no longer to the world, but only live for you. We acclaim this and we receive it in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's creation said, amen. amen. If you said that prayer today and it was the very first time you've said it, we believe that you're born again, that you are a new creation in Christ. I want you to tell somebody. Matter of fact, you might even want to go shout it. I want you to tell somebody. If you're online, I want you to call us this afternoon. Amy said she's got my cell phone. My cards are out there with my cell phone. Doug's cell phone's on there. <laughs> call us up. Now, 420 in the morning is not always the best time to do that. Some of you like to do that. You're like, well, you're up, aren't you, Steve? And I said, I do actually sleep sometime. Um, 420, I'm usually asleep. But we would love for you to call us and tell us. And we'll meet you somewhere. We might bring a few people with us and we'll celebrate together and we'll get you plugged into a discipleship group so you can continue this lifelong faith journey with a family of faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.